My name is Phil Hanlon and I'm Professor of Public Health at Glasgow University. Ten years ago, the Glasgow Centre for Population Health was established to create fresh thinking in the confrontation of Glasgow's intractable public health problems. The seminar series has been one of the chief ways in which that fresh thinking has been developed and shared. And it's my daunting task to review 10 years of the seminar series. What have we learned and what are the implications of what we've learned for the health of Glasgow? Um, I'll try and suggest that there are a large number of themes that really matter. History matters, the determinants of health matters, the economy matters, the inner life matters, transformational change and resilience, and above all, ecology matters. And we'll try and show how these themes have given us a fresh perspective on what needs to happen in Glasgow. Carol, thank you for the kind uh, introduction. Um, thank you too, Andrew. I mean, when I went back and reread and listened to so many of the seminars again, I just thought what an extraordinary kaleidoscope of presenters and speakers you have brought together. So uh, let me add my thanks to you for that. And um, what I'm going to try and do is give you my take on what we've learned. It has to be my take. As I look around the audience, there's um, many people who could actually give this lecture, and each would probably give a different take, and that's just part of the beauty of such a big and important resource. I'll, I'll say a bit too about what we should do, although I think it best if we leave some of that for the discussion, because I think there'll be, there'll be views on that, and, and that will be good if that can emerge through discussion. Um, the mission mattered. This phrase, fresh thinking. Uh, Malcolm Chisholm, who was then Minister of Health, came through to Glasgow and met with Sir John Abuthnock and with Tom Divers and uh, Kevin Woods and Harry Burns and myself and Sally McIntyre and others. And he was the one who, after all, put the money up. Um, and uh, he, he said, you know, we, we, we need fresh ideas. He wasn't looking for new. He recognized that there was a lot of wisdom and energy in the city, but there needed to be a fresh take on things. And I think the seminar series has been one of the ways in which fresh thinking has been developed. And as Carol has said, we started off with Anthony Grayling. And what I took from that was several things. Um, he obviously loves Greek philosophy and Greek philosophers. Um, and I knew not so much. I've actually read a bit more of it since I've been stimulated by him. And I remember him talking about the idea of the golden mean. So he said what happened was that in, 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 in Greece, people would debate with each other about how to live. What's, what is the good life? individually and communally. And one of the debates they had was, and they developed this idea of the golden mean. So the opposite of cowardice is not bravery. The opposite of cowardice is recklessness. And the wise citizen sought the golden mean, which was courage. And, you know, the, the idea that that sort of notion should be uh, debated and emerged for the first time in human uh, dialogue. It's just an exciting idea. And what Anthony Grayling was trying to suggest to us was this, that there, this is worth the candle. You know, human beings need to do this stuff. We need to debate with each other, engage with each other about how we should live as individuals and how we should live collectively. And that was an endeavor worth pursuing. That was his message to us, and what a way to begin the seminar series. And he said that the means by which it was pursued in Greece was what he called, in Athens particularly, I think, was the civic conversation. And he encouraged us to develop a civic conversation, which I think we tried to do formally, but I think more successfully it has emerged informally. And um, I'm, I'm going to touch on the referendum debate from time to time, because it's hard not to. Um, People were amazed at just how engaged Scots became. I'm going to be a little critical about what they became engaged in, but anyway, we'll come on to that. Um, but we, we see a ferment of debate, and we see genuine concern and, and real commitment to this idea of the civic conversation. So um, I think the seminar series and Anthony Graham's contribution has contributed in part to that development in Scotland. In season two, you, you see that in the Manchester season is, is the S and uh, the lecture uh, number, if you want to go back and find any of them. Tom Devine came along. He's a historian, 
And he shared with us his insights into Scottish history. And I want to spend a few minutes on this. I want to say this, that I think one of the things the public health community has come to appreciate about Glasgow and Scotland is the importance of our history. Um, I think Tom Devine has contributed to that, but he's not the only one. Fiona Crawford uh, produced, uh, um, I can never remember, Let Gla no, which one is it? Will Glasgow Flourish? Yes, we'll, we'll come on to Let Glasgow Flourish in a moment. Uh, David and Bruce, in their own way and in their own works, um, have drawn on the history of Glasgow. A couple of our PhD students have contributed to that and others as well. And I think an appreciation of how Glasgow came to be as it is today is part of what has enriched our analysis. So let's just run through some of the highlights of what these various contributors have done with Tom Devine as a hanging point for it all. Um, I was in Stirling two weeks ago, and if you walk along the fourth uh, bank, uh, or the, the banks that are the fourth there, you, you've got information boards about the fact that Stirling used to be a port, a medieval city, the, the strategic city of Scotland, but Scotland, as these information boards say, faced eastwards to the Low Countries. And that's where trade was, and Stirling was a key port in all of that. The West was relatively underdeveloped. Tom Devine alludes to this uh, in, in the latter part of his lecture. What changed? What changed was a variety of factors. And forgive me if I spend a moment or two on this, because I think it's important. The Union the British Empire, the Scottish Enlightenment, and the natural resources, particularly the river and the harbour, iron ore, coal, and to a degree limestone. These forces came together to give um, Glasgow an opportunity, or West Scotland an opportunity. So the Scottish Enlightenment created a mindset, an approach, which took advantage of new developments. The British Empire opened up a protected market, somewhat more to our shame, the triangular trade in slaves, in cotton and then tobacco, created great wealth and capital which allowed the city to develop. And if you look round about you at this city and what we have, I think it's a troublesome legacy that much of it was initially built on the exploitation and the de-development of large parts of the world, particularly the west coast of Africa. So that's our history. And as the Atlantic, North America, and the empire became the focus of trade, so the west coast of Scotland became more important. And the wealth that began to accumulate through that trade in Glasgow made it the, first of all, hub of early capitalism, as Adam Smith describes. It was in the apparently Brumey Law where many of his key informant interviews happened, um, although I'm sure he didn't call them that at the time. Um, and then in time, the industrialization of that region. And that's what created the wealth and the opportunity and created the modern region and city that we now know. And in Tom Devine's description of it, um, that reached its peak in the late um, 1800s, in the latter part of the 19th century. And already by that time, and certainly by the early 20th century, the competitiveness of that industrial complex that had been created was already under threat. It was under threat in part because it was run by large families who were always low wage payers and always very concerned to take money out the businesses. That was his critique. It was also a region which sadly was characterized by a degree of um, sectarianism, and that was a weakness. But two world wars extended the life of the complex. We needed ships, we needed locomotives, we needed steel. And so while there might have been, under other circumstances, a decline and change in adaptation, by the 1960s, Glasgow and its hinterland was largely unchanged. And Tom Devine's key argument is this, that Glasgow and Scotland has changed more since the 1960s 
than it had in the previous 100 years. In other words, it was 100 to 150 years of continuity which came to an end in that period. And it came to an end through a series of forces. I'm going to, I'm going to return to this, but we saw a rapid deindustrialization. And if you look at the work that Gordon Daniels has just completed in his PhD, we can see that there's a more rapid deindustrialization than almost any other region of Europe, and many other regions of Europe were deindustrialized. And we moved into the modern era of globalization. And that brought with it a whole series of changes which brought opportunity, economic growth, and privilege to some, indeed to many, um, and many within Scotland. But it also brought a widening of inequalities and the creation of large communities which previously existed as the dormitory area for uh, industrial or manufacturing uh, complexes. And literally overnight, some of these were decimated and we're still living with the legacy thereof. So that was his, that was his analysis. And when he asked the question, why has Scotland failed to celebrate the extraordinary economic progress that's been made since the 1960s? And he quoted some of the data and it is extraordinary. Scotland has become a rich, diverse economy with many people enjoying prosperity, and we only need to look around this room to see some of that. You can see in the way in the referendum debate, the SNP in particular celebrated the strength and diversity of the Scottish economy compared with, for instance, the northeast and northwest of England. All of that's the achievement of that period. And Tom Devine asked the question, and why do we fail to celebrate it, and why do we do the opposite? And his answer was inequality. That too many of our fellow citizens have failed to benefit from that change. And indeed, too many of them have languished in a, a strange twilight zone of never quite emerging from the collapse of the industrial period. So that was his analysis, and I think an important further contribution to our thinking. The next thing I'm going to suggest that matters, that emerges through many of the presentations, is that health status matters. Well, of course it matters. Comes, it's the Glasgow Centre for Population Health. Uh, uh, you know, it, it's going to have to matter. But it matters in a much more symbiotic and two-way relationship to the ideas that are being presented than uh, perhaps is always appreciated. So Michael Marmot, I forgot that Michael Marmot actually did a Glasgow University lecture because much of the same audience was there. Um, but anyway, I'm going to include him as an ordinary, uh, honorary member of our, of our grouping. Michael Marmot made the argument at Glasgow University that life expectancy and health status in general is an exquisite indicator of how well a population is doing. And I thought that was, that was very insightful. And... Um, he gave the example, and that's been further amplified by other work that's been done by David and Gordon and others. If you look at the Soviet Union, at the time of the communist revolution, it was a feudal economy. Life expectancy was very poor. Um, say what you like about Stalinism and all of that. It put uh, food in people's stomachs, gave them gainful employment, and turned that feudal economy rapidly into an industrial economy. When people move off the land throughout Europe into industry, their productivity increases and the wealth of the country increases. And health followed that trend. People benefited from those changes and they bought in to the regime, is the argument. And by the 1960s, you can hear uh, President Kennedy joke um, when asked what he said he was going to put a man on the moon, and the reporter asked him, what do you think you'll find when we get there, Mr. President? And he said, Russians. Um, <laughs> because at that stage, the Russians were ahead. And if you look at the life expectancy of Russians at that early 1960s period, they, were, they had better male and female life expectancy than many countries in Europe, including the likes of Spain, Italy. But from the 1960s onwards the life expectancy plateaued. And if you had been an astute member of the Politburo, you would have brought that to your colleagues' attention. You know, if, if, this, if this country is such a success, why aren't we continuing to see 
improvements in life expectancy in the way that they are in Western Europe. But they clearly, if anyone did bring that information to the table, ignored it, and they carried on. And what's clear now in retrospect from accounts was that from about the 1960s onwards, people lost faith in the regime. It lost legitimacy. Its economy um, stagnated. And 20 years later, we're now celebrating the anniversary of the fall of the Berlin Wall. Now, my point about this is that if we then turn to Glasgow and reports like Let Glasgow Flourish, which I think was a landmark report, the more sophisticated understanding Glasgow, which shows the interrelationship between the factors we understand to be important for health and so on and so forth, we can see that Scotland as a whole, from that period from about the 1970s onwards, suffered relative decline. Life expectancy improves, but relative decline. And this extraordinary phenomenon, and I know David's on a campaign for us not to use the phrase Glasgow effect, but I'll use it for shorthand if I can be forgiven for so doing. But the so-called Scottish and Glasgow effects, which are being the subject of so much further research, you know, if we sat around in our civic conversation, whatever else we do, whether we can pin down the specific causes of these phenomena, we'd be saying to ourselves, Surely in the same way as the Russians should have realized there was something wrong with their society, something wrong with the legitimacy of their leadership, should our life expectancy and health data not be giving us an equivalent challenge? And I would have to say that it's, it hasn't really. I mean, there's plenty of rubbing of hands and lamenting of our high death rates and our relative uh, uh, decline in life expectancy, and particularly our inequality. But there's not, there's not a dynamic for change that follows that. And the danger would be that we go the way of the Soviet Union, a subject for discussion when we come to that. <laughs> Another theme I think that really mattered, and I'll choose Bruce Link's um, presentation in series four, to highlight this, and I think Jerry is in the, uh, in the audience someplace. Yes, the, uh, Jerry. Uh, Jerry's got a lovely slide, which if I had, I might have included here, um, showing different epidemics, as it were. And we'll use Glasgow, it, it's true of the industrialized world. But there's the cholera or waterborne epidemic rising and then falling. Then the respiratory borne infections, particularly tuberculosis, rising and falling. Then the great chronic diseases, heart disease, cancers rising and indeed falling, for they have done so. And more recently, epidemics of alcohol-related harm, suicide, drug use, and so on and so forth, possibly reaching something of a peak. We'll, we'll watch the data over coming years with some interest. Now, the point about this that Bruce Link brings out is that the reason why we see these phenomena in this matter and why the poor are most affected by them in each wave is that the problem is not cholera or TB or heart disease or indeed alcohol. The problem is the fundamental drivers of these epidemics and the uneven distribution of power, opportunity, resource, and everything else within societies. He used North America to provide his examples, but the story is equally valid and real for here. Now, I think we've known that before the seminar series, but there's real power and worth in having someone from North America come and make the comparable data so evident. And I think we often ignore it. I think we only have to look to a Westminster government that points to individual behavior. I think we have to look to colleagues who we debate with who make much of, for example, the fact that about half of the variance in inequalities in death can be attributed to smoking-related disorders. Yeah? And that kind of gives a suggestion that if only we had a magic wand and could get rid of smoking, we'd do something profound about inequalities. But Bruce Link's work says, no, you wouldn't. All you'd do is get smoking replaced by whatever comes along next as the affliction of the gradient of inequality. And that's a really important insight. It's not to say that we shouldn't do something about smoking. 
And I'm going to focus tonight more on what we've called the fresh thinking. I don't want for a moment anyone to get the idea that therefore I'm suggesting that we shouldn't be doing stuff on minimal pricing or about plain packaging and all of that kind of stuff. That's the, that's the work of public health that needs to continue and has, I'm sure, the wholesome and wholehearted support of everyone in this room. But if we're thinking of what fresh thinking is, then Bruce Link's insight is key. And there was a little while, and we'll come on to Harry's presentation a little later, there was a little while when there were as almost two towers within Scotland. There was the chief medical officer with a much more individualized approach, and there was Health Scotland and others with a much more uh, uh, fundamental determinants approach. Um, and it would be good in discussion to have any reflections on where that currently stands. Biology matters. This has been a big theme. A lot of presenters have only picked out three of them there. You could find many more. Now, why, why would we need to be reminded of that? I think the main reason why they've come into the seminar series is that we now understand in much more detail and in, frankly, quite exciting ways. You know, brain scans of the amadaya getting bigger or smaller or prefrontal lobes developing or being atrophied by assault. These are very exciting slides. People love them. <laughs> so, um, you know, that's part of the reason why that's a big theme. And these, these, things, these things have come through in the last 10 years, and it would have been wrong for us not to focus on them. I would like to suggest to you, though, that the, the role of biology gets wrapped up in what's sometimes pejoratively called the medical model. Now, the medical model stems from the fact that within our society, at least, medicine has commanded power, resource, and influence. And for that reason, it's often drawn resource to a, a very much downstream disease treatment priority. And those who worked in public health have had to try and argue for other priorities. Um, you know, and so you end up undermining, you know, uh, the seeming prestige and power of doctors. And, uh, and McEwen did that work in the 1970s and so on. I don't want to get in there. Could easily be subverted into all of that, but we'll avoid that, uh, uh, that digression. Um, balance is needed though, isn't it? You know, I often say to medical students when I'm talking to them, when I get knocked off my bike, yes, and I come into casualty with my femur sticking through my thigh, I do not want the social model of medicine, thank you very much. <laughs> you know, I, I would want big doses of morphine followed by the medical model, you know. So it has its place. That, that's a facetious but obvious point. And no one ever believed, if you look at the Black Report, where it argues that inequalities are fundamentally driven by structural and economic forces, no one ever imagined, though, that that then transported itself into a diminished life expectancy by magic. It was always assumed by black and everyone else that it manifested itself in chronic disease and in other ways by a process or processes that were biological. And what we've done in the last 10 years is we've come to understand those processes much more. And key to them, or key particularly to the chronic diseases of the 20th centuries and the external causes mental health type disorders associated with chronic stress of the 21st century is the balance of adrenaline, noradrenaline, the activation of the sympathetic, parasympathetic nervous systems, the role particularly in chronic stress of cortisol and the control mechanisms thereof. And these presenters speak of these. At one level, there's, it's not as fancy as it sounds when I went back to listen to it all. You know, we've known quite a lot of it for quite a long time. But we now have the cohort studies to show the effects. And in particular, we have the analytical studies to show that these things can be clearly correlated with adverse disease outcomes. And we now better understand, for instance, the link between chronic stress and the upregulation of inflammation. And also with key changes in the brain, which often have to do with early life influences, for the good as well as for the bad. And then you add into the mix that magical word, epigenetics. Oh, how will we love those kind of ideas. And here we have the idea that some of these adverse influences in earlier life, particularly, 
can change which genes are turned on and off, and thus which balance of hormones and control mechanisms are at play, and thus the likelihood of, for instance, hypertension, particularly type 2 diabetes, the metabolic syndrome, and the like in later life. And I think there's much more yet to be discovered about all of that, and it does matter. And a big theme of the programme has been looking at it. At the same time, and I pick out three, we're not biological machines. We're human beings. And as human beings, what goes on in our interior subjective lives, that really matters. After Offa, I particularly liked his, I went back and listened to it all again, um, he, he made two really important points. He says, all these years of human development, evolutionary uh, change, have made us short-term hedonists. Yeah? Um, it didn't pay to plan for retirement on the Samana. Now, that's his basic argument. But human beings also recognize that you, do, you did need some form of long-term planning for lots of things. And so what he says is what we did was we created what he called commitment devices. So if you need to save for retirement, you have to save. And you have the incentive of your employer giving a contribution as well. Um, as a short-term hedonist, you might be uh, tempted to philander. So we invent the idea of marriage as a sacred commitment. Now, we recognize that we need commitment devices. And that was quite an almost unique strain to the thinking. He also talked about the hedonic treadmill. As short-term hedonists placed in today's society, where so much money can be made for pandering to our short-term hedonism, it can get carried away. And we can be caught on what he called a treadmill of constantly seeking pleasure and short-term reward with diminished satisfaction each time and a very uncomfortable and unpleasant set of outcomes that follow. Richard Layard was an unapologetic utilitarian. He said that basically, if you look at our psychology, we've got this warped desire to pursue money and status. Partially because it, in history, gave us other rewards. But we don't know when to stop. And his argument was that we should organize our civic conversation, our social policy to maximize, for want of a better word, happiness. I know there's been much debate about this term, happiness, but you know what he means by that. Uh, the, the utility of uh, fulfillment, rather than the continued multiplication of wealth. And that's a theme that comes up several times and to which I will return. And Oliver James, through interviews in some of the great cities of the globe, he went to Shanghai, to Sydney, to New York, to Copenhagen, and elsewhere, and he interviewed people who were rich. And he discovered a, sing a similar pathology in all of these places. They're dissatisfied. They tell him they would be satisfied if they just had more money. They spend an uncomfortable amount of time pursuing money. And they have none of the deep existential satisfaction that others in other circumstances uh, uh, display. His one exception was Denmark. And um, he attributed the relatively soft and humane approach of Danish rich males to Danish females. And he said, in Denmark, if you appeared with your Rolex watch and your BMW, the women would just laugh at you <laughs> and tell you, just stop to being so much up yourself. <laughs> and so they went. And uh, what got you women in Denmark is to be orientated towards family and children and more human and humane values. Now, 
I can't speak to the veracity of his findings. And basically, he was being a journalist rather than a researcher. But it's interesting stuff nonetheless. And I take from it this whole business that what goes on in our heads matters. And if you go back to Tom Devine's argument, Tom Devine said that um, if, if you go back to that early industrial periods, Scots derive their sense of being and self from a variety, almost a hierarchy of factors. Empire, church, work, family. These were the things that sustained your sense of being a person and your, your sense of who you were within society. And he argued that all four have largely been eroded or destroyed in recent times. And in that globalized period, in its place, we've seen a much more competitive, individualized notion of self emerging where you are a brand, where you in the workplace need to be competitive, promote yourself. And um, to use uh, another author's way of talking of this, in that industrial economy, people sought to be of good character. Um, I hope this isn't too unfair, but it's said that the millennial generation now want to be of good personality. And that's an important distinction. But my more general observation is that this idea that our inner life, our sense of what a human being is, what our purpose is, how a good society is organized, that subjective and that intersubjective idea is a powerful influence on how we behave, how we organize our society, and what our health status is like. The economy matters. Um, Tim Jackson, I think, gave one of the most important contributions. And his argument links to my next slide, which is that ecology matters. So I can't deal with them both on the same slide. I uh, can't do fancy slides, so we'll just link them to in, in thought. His basic argument was this, that if you look at the nations of the globe, uh, there's a dog leg. A very poor nation has very low life expectancy. But you give it a bit more wealth, and its life expectancy rises rapidly. And at about the cusp point of $15,000 per capita, you get a dog leg. And all the other countries are laid out at about a similar life expectancy. And you become a lot, lot richer, and you gain very little extra life expectancy. That's important. Now, let's be clear. Within societies, differentials in wealth give markedly different health outcomes. And that's, that's an important distinction. But nonetheless, Tim Jackson was making an argument that we should be striving for an economy that, um, going back to Richard Layard, fulfills human potential, human flourishing, not the maximization of consumption and economic activity, whether that activity be good, bad, or ugly. Guy Standing, I think, gave an equally important contribution. And what he was saying was that he detects the emergence of a new class. He calls it the precariat, as in precarious, in occupations that don't give the same sense of security, of um, economic well-being, and possibilities of development in life that jobs might have done in a previous generation. He lays the charge squarely at neoliberal economics. He goes back to that period, and it's now, if we go back to Tom Devine's history of, of Scotland and of Glasgow, you go back to the 1970s, um, and you see a rapid deindustrialization. Now, I've done a bit of reading about this, and it depends on the political flavor of the writer. The writers of the left say that this was a response to several things. A rise of worker power. If you look at Europe, North America, Japan, from the end of the Second World War, in the Reconstruction, you see rapid economic growth in all these countries. But the pathway was very different. Germany, for instance, took a much more cooperative approach between industry, government, and the unions. France took a somewhat paternalistic one. Scotland, in line with what had gone before, low-wage economy, somewhat adversarial, adversarial approach to labor relationships, that whole trend continued. 
even as economic growth continued. Um, but nonetheless, inequalities in income reduced in those decades after the Second World War throughout most of Europe, including the, the United Kingdom. But the period of consensus and economic growth came to an end in the 1970s with inflation and stagnation, what they called stagflation. The Arab-Israeli war and the rise in oil prices, an eightfold increase over a relatively short period of time, was a key catalyst to that change. But there are many of the left who argue that those with a mind to do so used it as an opportunity to solve what they called the labor problem. I don't mean labor as in a political force, but labor as in people who do work. And they globalized the supply of labor, they globalized the movement of capital, they created opportunity for investment in other parts of the world, but they also diminished the power of workforces in Europe to command the same wages, and the result of that is the precariat. That was his argument, and it seems to me to be a powerful and important one. Now, there are other interpretations of that period, and you would hear different ones from different people, but that's what Guy Standing brought to our thinking. Geoffrey Bolton brings in a theme which I think is through many of the presentations. I think, Andrew, you've been keen to get this theme in. But I would have to say it is not a theme that I hear much discussed or much reflected in the policy community in Scotland or even the public health community. Not at least in formal terms. And basically what Geoffrey Bolton was saying was this. I mean, he said lots of things. Um, uh, for instance, this stuff about Darwin, Copernicus, is the idea about the inner life changing. There was a time when human beings really did believe themselves to be the center of the universe, the universe being created for them, and uh, you know, all would be well for that reason. And we've come to realize that we are a rather insignificant part of the universe, and a rather small galaxy in the periphery of whatever, yeah? And um, here we are, and that's a very different world view. So he brought that out. But the main point he was trying to make was this, that the world, or our globe, over the eons of its history has been a very inhospitable place for human beings if we had sought to exist at other times. And that we've emerged in a very benign period, the inter interglacial period our civilization has, has emerged in that time. And it's given us the idea of stability. He then goes on to highlight this issue of overshoot, the so-called carrying capacity of the globe. And it's a very simple idea. If we take any one of us here, it takes a certain amount of land and sea to sustain us in the manner to which we've come accustomed. And if you multiply those figures up by the number of people on the earth and their average number of uh, hectare uh, use, at some point, in theory, the area is equivalent to the area of the globe. And by these calculations, and you can find them easily on websites, that was passed sometime in the 1970s. At about the same time, as the oil crisis was happening, that the West was going through its great change of deindustrialization, and the whole process of globalization was happening. And here I'm going to add my little thought. This wasn't what Jeffrey Bolton brought to us, but my little thought is this. What if it's true that one of the reasons why that period of development, greater equity, economic growth after the Second World War in part, if not in profound cause, came to an end because of overshoot. Because the globe, from that point onwards, if we continue to grow in human numbers or in activity, we need to borrow either from the past by raiding, for instance, fossil fuels, or from the future by destroying the acidity of the ocean or the biodiversity of, the spe of, of species or agricultural land or aquifers of water and so on and so forth. And that's expensive. And the feedback loops erode that conventional notion of economic growth. I think there's something to be said for that and I would be interested in views when we come back to it. Jim Scott, James Scott, came along and talked about the limits of the state um, he talked about Bismarck's Germany. I listened to a program on the radio the other day there about Bismarck's Germany. It was only 15 minutes long, 
and it's worth going to on the radio iPlayer. He was an extraordinary person um, in the sense that if you were German and a bit chauvinistic and nationalistic, you'd have loved Bismarck. Uh, he made a real difference. He put, literally put Germany on the map, um, expanded their industry at breakneck pace, and made them the, do the dominant power all in the course of 20 to 30 years. But he was an arch-modernist. What happened in his head was about um, analysis, action, consequence. And he took that approach to forestry. He appointed a ministry of forestry. And the monoculture and the abstraction of something that was basically organic, that had sustained and been the source of pride for the German people for literally millennia, he almost destroyed. Oh, Bismarck didn't, but his, his minister of forestry almost did. And James Scott, in his book and in his lecture, alludes to that phenomenon. And he uses that as a starting point for saying, there are things that the state is good at, and there are things that actually represent overreach that the state, when it acts as a bureaucracy, treating things in the abstract, simply make things worse when it interferes. At the very least, there are limits to the state's ability to make things happen. Now, if you take that into our sphere, we've had now, Carol will tell us, uh, working party at the Scottish Government on inequality now for 10 years, thereabouts. Sincere people, best advice, probably the best data in the world on inequality brought to bear. Uh, the report came out for 2014, and I would say at best we've stabilized the problem, far rest reversed it. The key question is though, is it within the state's ability within the globalized world that we've been describing to do that? Um, Harry's lecture uh, paints a very optimistic picture of the possibility of phenomena like co-production, improvement methodologies, new insights from biological science coming together to create diminished inequalities. Do we believe that that is the technocratic way to that solution or is something more profound needed? Resilience matters. Um, two contributions I want to highlight here. Uh, Jerry Stern and, and his wife came along and talked about positive deviance. Wonderful stories, actually, really, is what he told, of examples from around the world of communities that faced adversity and difficulty, actually, many of them much more profound than we could even talk of in West Central Scotland. And in the midst of that, there emerges individuals, families, and communities who overcome against the odds. And um, his is just worth listening to for the sheer inspiration thereof. Um, Anthony Hodgson, um, there's an IFF theme running through all of these, as you'd expect from Andrew's influence, and Anthony's one of the IFF uh, uh, family. And um, he talks about this idea, I don't want to go into it in any great detail, of panarchy. This is an idea from nature or from ecology. And the basic idea is, if you apply it, for instance, to large forests, large forests start small, grow, mature, become very complex and interdependent, but become less resilient as they become more mature. So there's all this wood and vegetation and uh, in, interrelationship and interdependency, and uh, what, the, what it's no longer is nimble. And what usually happens is a forest fire or some such thing. And he uses that to say, in what way is the forest resilient? Well, he says the forest is resilient in its ability not to re-establish its previous position, but actually to bounce back to something even more nimble and better. And what you see is a bigger diversity of young trees and plants develop which provide the framework for the regeneration of the forest. Now, if you take that idea and apply it to history, and you think of, for instance, the medieval period and how we changed into the modern period, you can see something analogous. There had to be the death of one system to allow another system to emerge. And so, 
some of our ideas of resilience might require that level of transformation. Somewhat analogously, David Riley talked to us about human healing. His central metaphor is the plant. And those of you who have been along to David's well program meetings, sometimes you'll have seen him lay a plant in the middle of the room. And he says to the people participating in the group, he says, go on, make it grow. Yeah. And the ridiculousness of that notion is obvious. Um, of course, it's relevant to talk about systems and structures and economies and abstractions and all the rest of it, and they are important to health. But when we consider something organic, like human health or the thriving or otherwise of a plant, then we're into organic caring metaphors. And David, in his lecture, used those to illustrate the capacity of human beings to thrive and to heal. And indeed, the the desire, the yearning that all human beings have to flourish, and how it's often the adverse factors that hold that back, and thus the task is to clear some of those adverse factors away to allow human flourishing to emerge. And if you put that idea together with some of the things that were said about resilience, I think that's another strong and important theme. Maureen O'Hara came along and talked about modernity and its impact upon us. She was thinking about how people have reacted to these 30, 40 years or so of globalization, of individualism, of competition, of consumerism and the like. And she described three responses. Um, I won't describe them as well as she can. You need to go back to the text to get that. But in, in my head, there were the neurotic response. <laughs> go away. I don't want this. The psychotic response. You bastard. and the transformational response. And she encouraged us to do two things. To recognize the emergent new consciousness that was leading to transformation in ourselves and in others, and to recognize that in changing times, what is fundamental to change is the emergence of a new collective consciousness, which takes us back to Anthony Grayling and the idea of the civic conversation and people getting together and working out a new way of thinking about what it is to be a human being, how to relate to each other and how to cope with adversity. And another thought she had, it's quite soft in her thinking, but I think it's very real. She says it's, it's only when we find ourselves in that really tough, difficult situation that the new consciousness really emerges. Without the adversity of the need for change, Human beings are somewhat prone to stay in their neurotic or psychotic responses. And in that sense, some of the things that we had been talking about in the history of Glasgow, in the challenges of the precariat, in the ecological challenge of our time, in the idea that we need to find how to live with prosperity but not growth, it is those very challenges which are pulling out the consciousness to create whatever comes next. Um, a cautionary tale, uh, if you go back and listen to her, she picks Obama as an example of emerging consciousness. I sense she wouldn't do so today. <laughs> and I'm not going to pick any examples for that very reason. This set of ideas fed into our own work, and uh, Andrew's here, and Margaret's here, and David Riley I've mentioned, and we and others have been thinking about the crisis of modernity. The idea that modernity has brought great benefits has been characterized by progress, but is now beginning to show signs of adverse outcomes, obesity, uh, alcohol-related harm, rising inequalities, and particularly the ecological uh, erosion that we spoke of. The need, therefore, for something new to emerge. The recognition that in recent times, the inner life has been characterized by individualism, consumerism, and materialism. And if I touch on the referendum debate, I was excited by the engagement, particularly of the young. I was pleased that Scotland had that moment uh, when it seemed the whole country was in ferment. Um, I, I found it exciting. But I was deeply disappointed at how materialist the argument was on both sides of the argument. 
um, how little reference there was to a need to live within global resources. The idea that we, we, we could be a renewable superpower, to quote our recently resigned First Minister, at the same time as being a petrodollar economy, and so it goes on. Um, and so I think that we, we are far from escaping that circle currently. Uh, we suffer from the modern epidemics that we know about, and our ideology collectively is one of economism, where the economic calculus is central to almost all decision making, and a seemingly undentable belief in the idea of progress in the Enlightenment sense, but also more generally in a technocratic sense, and of the desirability and indeed inevitability, indeed almost uh, foundational belief in economic growth. Now, if that is a headline summary of our current uh, circumstance, what needs to change? And I would suggest that, and many of you have seen this diagram before, so this column is about the inner life at the individual level and the intersubjective or cultural level. This is the outer world, the objective level, and the uh, collective structural economic level. And the basic argument I would put is that what we've learned from this MNR series is that if Scotland's health is to improve, if Glasgow is to confront what were called seemingly intractable problems, we need, now don't get me wrong, just let me, let me be clear on this, I'm not disparaging all the regular stuff that we need to do, um, you know, the integration agenda, the care of the elderly, all of that needs to happen. Uh, stuff on tobacco and uh, sexual health, all of that, I, I, I'm not talking about that. I'm saying if we have to confront intractable problems with fresh thinking, we would need to develop a way of being, living, acting, which reflects an inner life, a biology, an economical, social structure, and a culture, all of it changing together to inhabit and flourish in a globe with probably between 9 and 10 billion people, continuing overshoot of resources, continuing degra de degrading of the climate and other factors, an economic globalization where the 1% that owns the power and now has, I think, 46% of the global resources, aren't going to give that up easily. Yet, inspired by the notion, and on this I shall close, that if we look at the history of West Central Scotland, if we look at the history of human beings, um, we've been through stuff before, and we've managed it, and we can do this again. Thank you very much indeed.